Welcome to your market brief for Monday, December 2nd from the NASDAQ market site. The Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P 500 are set to open the week higher on this Cyber Monday. We'll break down how the holiday shopping season is shaping up. In terms of earnings, we'll hear from Salesforce, Slack, Campbell Soup, Tiffany, Dollar General, and Kroger this week. We'll also have our eye on key U.S. reports on manufacturing, construction, and employment. And we'll be watching Apple following announcements from this afternoon's press event. Plus, the House Judiciary Committee is holding a public impeachment hearing on Wednesday, and OPEC will meet Thursday and Friday in Vienna. All right, next up, we welcome Mark Levine, former chairman of the Illinois State Board of Investment, where he oversaw $24 billion on behalf of 160,000 state employees. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you have some, uh, some investment ideas for value still in these record high markets, but before we get to those, I want to talk about your tenure. During your tenure, sure. you basically fired most of the active managers. You kind of took on hedge funds and uh, favored passive investing. What was behind that move? And is that a strategy that you continue to stand beyond, behind? Yeah, no, I do continue to stand behind it. What, um, when I, when I, so I, I ran the Illinois pension for about four years. And when I first got there, I didn't really have any agenda on these elements, but you know, you have to look at the portfolio and do the right thing. And initially, when we looked at the hedge, particularly the hedge fund portfolio, which was 10% of our book, um, what they were beating this, they were beating their benchmark, but their benchmark was a joke. The benchmark was an industry average, which for the stock pickers is stock markets after you pay two and twenty. That's kind of silly. So what we did was we brought in the the appropriate benchmarks, which are stock market be, right, uh, returns. And what we saw was for our stock picking hedge funds, they, they were underperforming index funds, which of course we get for free. Uh, they were underperforming by about 150 basis points. So that doesn't make any sense, right? And then there was a whole other batch of hedge funds that are more kind of where they, which don't have bait in them. And you're really looking for great absolute returns. There may be 8%, 10%, and they're generating like one or 2%. That doesn't make sense either. That was less than cash. So we decided to basically get out of all of them. Not that we got out of all active management, but we got out of every, all these, these kind of these, these hedge funds that were really destroying value for us. With enormous fees. With enormous fees, which is, of course, one of the key reasons why they were destroying so much value. All right, so let's talk about your picks. If you're still in favor of passive over active, no surprise, you have a few ETF picks for us. And you're saying it's not too late in the game to, to get in. The market's not too high to get in at this point. Yeah, well, it's, see, market timing just really never works. If you're investing for the next three years, I'd be pretty nervous right now. But if you're investing for the next five, 10 lifetime, okay, then it's, you know, I look at the market and it doesn't particularly frighten me. So the, the, places, where, the places where I put my own money is um, things like VTI. So VTI is Vanguard's full US stock market. What I like about, I like a couple things about it. First of all, I like having the small cap in there so you don't have to worry about reweightings between large and small. I also like the fact when I was running the Illinois pension, we actually moved from Russell 2000 to the S&P 600 for our small cap passive. And we did that because S&P puts in a quality screen. Now Vanguard actually does as well. They use a different, they don't use S&P, but I love having a quality screen on my small cap. So that's really the key there. For, um, you always want some international. International is actually pretty inexpensive these days. And there, my, my, my favorite is VEU. It also has the emerging markets with developed. And I think, again, making these artificial barriers between the two, just save yourself the time of rebalancing. And that way you don't miss out on the Alibabas and the 10 cents, which you don't want to miss out on. So, um, and then um, the last thing is, Look, the markets, um, I'm comfortable, but for sure there are stretch valuations. And it makes perfect sense to be a little bit nervous. And so for me, I, the way I accomplish sort of dealing with that risk is a value tilt, okay? And there's a couple ideas that, uh, a couple things that I do. One is VLUE, which is um, BlackRock's value-based um, value ETF. There's another smaller one that Vanguard has, which I love as well, VFBA. Um, but, um, but the reason why I like those two is the, the traditional value indexes, 
okay, really relied, I think, too much on book, on price to book value. Book value has just lost its significance as the economies change over the last 30 years with all the more tech, et cetera. And so these, these guys don't have that bias, and that's why I like those. All right, well, thank you for those. Sure. Good to know that it's not just a growth story. There is still value out there. Oh, for sure. Uh, I want to ask you about retirement. I mean, there is clearly a retirement crisis looming in America. It's kind of a three-part thing. There's the savings, there's Social Security, and then there's this pension crisis that you know right. all too well. I guess, what part of the story are we, do we not, are, do, or do you worry about the most? Mm -hmm. What part of the story isn't out there? Right, so um, what I, you know, what gets the most press, which are the, with these public sector pensions, like the one that I ran in, in the state of Illinois, which is severely underfunded, those, those get the most press, and those are very problematic. It's really difficult to undo. Once you get these defined benefit pensions rolling, they're, they're kind of unstable, they're inherently unstable, and they end up just sucking up so much taxpayer money and that's true, of course, at the local level as well. So those get a lot of press. They are very problematic. I think at some point the federal government's going to have to do something about this because basically the potholes have to get fixed. Going and the to traffic have to do lights something to about fixed. it. What are you saying? What is the federal government going to have to do? I think ultimately there's going to be some sort of grand bargain with um, maybe freezing, freezing benefits for more cat for for federal money. I see. I. Is that going to happen in the next couple of years? No, but is that going to happen in the next years? I says next ten years. I suspect it will. So a bargain uh, like a bailout? Yes, a bailout. Yeah, uh, that's not something I'm in favor of. I just, this is just what I think is going to happen. But I don't really worry the most about that because those are very rich benefits, right? Those are the, all those those beneficiaries are actually making more money in retirement, which is a big part of the problem, than they made while they worked. To me, the real retirement crisis is the lack of the lack of savings. For, for all Americans. Certainly something we'll continue to follow. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, shifting to retail with Black Friday in the books and with Cyber Monday underway, last week's Market Watch Twitter poll asked you about your holiday spending plans. Nearly half of you voted in favor of spending less this year instead of sticking with last year's budget or spending more. We're now joined by Tanya Garcia, retail and consumer reporter with Market Watch. Tanya, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's talk numbers. We had Black Friday, we had Thanksgiving sales, we had Small Business Saturday. You know, how did the weekend shape up and what does this tell you about the holiday shopping season that we're now officially in? Well, online we had some record setting days. Uh, Thanksgiving was up over $4 billion. Uh, Black Friday was a record setter with over $7 billion. And we're set up for Cyber Monday to be up over $9 billion. And these are all online sales. So we haven't even gotten to the store sales yet. So, so it looks like it's uh, starting off really well. Uh, the month of November was a, a strong selling month, so retailers should be happy. The holiday shopping season, though, is six days shorter this yeah. year between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and also it's missing a weekend. We're, we're down a weekend from last year. How are retailers making adjustments to try to make up for the, the shorter shopping period? How concerned are they? Uh, they? They are concerned. I mean, they pulled everything up a little bit sooner, right? So you had Walmart that was already offering uh, discounts and um, holiday deals before ha uh, Halloween. So, I mean, the retailers are aware that there's a shorter season, but a lot of shoppers are also using the uh, buy online shop in store options. So there's lots of ways for shoppers to kind of get around uh, that shorter season if they have the money to spend. And we know uh, online e-commerce is really the name of the game, but does this shorter holiday shopping season maybe hurt online retailers and favor brick and mortars because you don't have to worry about delivery time? You can just kind of go in and supermarket sweep right in right in the brick and mortar? There is something to be concerned about. Um, you know, there's always uh, this cutoff, and if the cutoff seems to approach a little bit more quickly, then then uh, you know, shoppers might do without or find alternatives. But a lot of the major uh, retailers, they have the capabilities for not just delivering things, but having them available so that shoppers can just come into the store and pick it up. Again, convenience is really the name of the game this year. Most certainly, but there's not, it's very upbeat right now because we had some record breaking online sales, but they're not all winners. 
there's very there's certainly losers. We're still seeing a retail apocalypse, I guess, if you will. Yeah. Uh, it's make or break for a lot of retailers. Who are some of the retailers at risk of, of breaking if this isn't a, a positive holiday shopping season? Well, any retailer that wasn't ready for uh, this convenience uh, necessity that the holidays are bringing forth. So, you know, if you're just getting your buy online, pick up in store kind of capability going, you have some uh, retailers, department store retailers, for instance, um, let's say like a JCPenney that's been hurting that really needs to have a good showing this year. But really across the board, all retailers need to have a good holiday uh, shopping season. So that's really what they're hoping for. It seems like it's going to be another holiday shopping season dominated by Walmart, Target, and Amazon, but it will certainly be interesting to see how it plays out. We have to leave it there. Tanya, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your insights. That concludes today's market brief, but we want to hear from you. Comment below. Where will markets be by the end of the year? Up, down, or sideways from current levels? I'm Caroline Woods. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next Monday.